My name is Jennings Bunn. Today is the 6th of September, 2017. Uh, the time is approximately 1400. We're at the home of Mr. Earl Mills, uh, just outside Live Oak, down on 49. Uh, the, his daughter uh, is also here, Ms. Weber. I mean, pardon me, Ms. Weaver. Weaver. I call you Weber. I'm sorry, Ms. Weaver, uh, whom we had talked several times on the phone. But uh, I wanted to ask your full name, Mr. Mills. Earl Victory Mills. And how old are you now? I'm 96 years old. And what date, when were you born? April 26, 1921. And where? Here in Lava. You're from Swanee County? Right. Outstanding. In an old house, the next house up the road there. Now, how long has your family been in this area? My my mother and dad's been in this area all their life. Do you know approximately when they came here? <clears throat> well, they were born here. They were born yeah, here my, in Yeah, my dad was uh, born in a log house across the road from here. Mm -hmm. And then in the community where she lives, uh, my mother was born in the Mount Olive community. Well, who were your grandparents? My, my grandparents? Yes, sir. Was, uh, Hanson Kelly Mills. Hanson Kelly Mills? Mm -hmm. And um, do you know where he came here from? He came here from North Carolina. Okay. Um, what family businesses were your grandfather and your father into here? Uh, well, what businesses? Well, they were, my, my dad and his family were farmers in this land right here. And so you're living on land I'm that belonged on to your land. grandfather. I'm living on the land they farmed on. My dad was born in a log house across the road here. Uh, will be. And uh, my grandmother came from South Carolina and then they, they, came, they came down from uh, Carolina and homesteaded here in Swanee County. Do you know approximately what year that would have been? I don't know what year it was. Okay. And do you know what part of North Carolina and South Carolina? I don't know the I don't know the the name of the town or the county or anything like that. All right, sir. All, all the information I got is they were just born in North and South Carolina. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm from North Carolina myself. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, in regards to memories in the family, uh, social and business life. Uh, as far as farming, uh, what aspect of farming were they into? Uh, what type of farming did yes, they? Sir. Have? Yes, sir. Well, they raised uh, they raised cows and hogs, and that was mainly for to, to eat off of, you know. And uh, the cows, the milk, we milked the cows for the milk we got from them, and the hogs we we killed, you know. To live off of to eat. Were they ever in the lumber business or? Uh, my dad or, or what? And he, my dad and his family was all farmers. But my <coughs> my uh, uh, grandparents that lived over in uh, Houston in Mount Olive area. Uh, they had a sawmill and uh, they had a sawmill, and a blacksmith shop, and a planer mill. And that was there, and they also ran a farm. It was that was their income. And that was in the Mount Olive area. That was uh, Mount Olive. Houston, how, it was a Houston, Florida area, in the neighborhood of Mount Olive. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's yes. Sir. Did they ever get into uh, into raising cotton or? Uh, uh, my dad uh, raised cotton at one time, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, just before the tobacco business came in here. And when the tobacco business came in here, then he quit raising cotton and started raising tobacco. Did he get hurt by the bow weevil infestation here uh, from the cotton? Yeah, they did. Uh, I know that was a major impact yeah. on the Sea Island cotton that was right. being raised here. So he went into tobacco, raising tobacco. 
tobacco, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, fluke, they call it fluke-cured tobacco, <laughs> but it had a barn, you know, and uh, you might be familiar with that. I am. Yeah. Yes, sir. And it was the smokehouse, I mean, the tobacco barn in this area here. Yes, <clears throat> It was in, uh, up there in that old house right up the road from here. <clears throat> well, uh, in your life, you've seen a lot of growth in this area. Um, can you tell me some about your early life and things you remember from back when you were a boy here? Well, when I was earlier in my life, uh, uh, when I was old enough, it was my job to get up in the morning and build a fire in the wood stove. We didn't have electricity out here then. Built fire in the wood stove, and I would go tell my mother that I had the fire and if it was winter time, I'd build a fire in the fireplace. And then I would go uh, tell my mother that I had the fire in the stove and she'd get up and st start cooking breakfast. And uh, me and my dad and my brothers would milk the cows. And then we, when we came back in, my mother would have uh, supper, I mean breakfast done. And uh, then we would get, go out to the field and start working. You remember the cold floors when you jump out of that bed and run to build that fire? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Where did you go to school? What school? Here? Well, I went to, through the eighth, eighth grade in a little country school down this country road across to, in front of my house, down there about five miles. And it was called Midway. I went through the eighth grade there. And then I went through the 11th grade high school in Lavu. And that's when I was inducted in the Army. And uh, then uh, I, I took an exam in the Army and got my degree for, for 12th grade. So they, they, were, they did have 12 grades yeah. when you were going to school? Right. When my daddy went to school, they were only 11 grades. So I was going to ask you, that was my next question, was it 11 or 12 grades? So 12 grades. Yeah, they had 12th grade here in Lavu. Uh, we'll be. Well, um, and this was all country road out here then. That's road out in front of the house, all country road. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, and uh, it was my job uh, to, to drive the cows down that country road over across the across the road into an area here that was a wooded area where the cows would graze there. And then in the afternoon, it was my job to get on a mule and go get those cows and bring them back. Oh, we'll and, uh, oh, we'll and we'd milk them again. Yes, sir. Well, I'd like to ask uh, uh, your wife, where was she, her name and where was she from? Myrtle, her wife, uh, it was Myrtle Inez Hardy was her name before we was married. And uh, she lived in Live Oak. Her daddy ran a, uh, uh, a shop there where he worked on automobiles and, and did odd kind of work like that. He, he did blacksmith work and uh, worked on automobiles. Was she the Hardy, the Governor Hardy that was here? No. It wasn't in the same family? No. They wasn't any kin. Really? That's yeah, that's kind of like the way <laughs> that, I, that I knew of. They wasn't any kin. Ah, okay, okay. And uh, she went to high school here in Live Oak. Yes, here. she did. She okay. was. Okay. How long were y'all married, sir? Pardon? How long were you married? We sixty-eight years. Sixty-eight years. My goodness gracious. Well. Is there anything on the, uh, the, uh, that you'd like to tell us about the history here, things you remember, uh, uh, things that happened here in Live Oak that you, you can recall? Uh, you remember the last shooting that took place up in town? You know, I can't recall. Uh, <clears throat> you mean uh, public shootings? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. It was uh, some of the Musgroves. There was a, a barber shop up there on the square. I remember that now. And uh, they had a little... He, he had a barber shop. Yes, sir. And they shot and killed the guy right there in the barber shop. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably about 1932, 33, somewhere along in there that happened. That's probably about right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, 
I wanted to ask, change the subject in a way, but uh, when did you go in the military? When I go in the military? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, entered the military on the uh, 25th of November, 1940. So you went in before the war ever started? Right. Actually, I was in the, uh, went in the National Guard, and uh, we went on maneuvers out in Louisiana. And uh, the way I got in there was some of my friends was uh, in the National Guard, and, and they said uh, they'd like for me to join it, and we could, you know, get to go somewhere and see something. We, had, we hadn't been out of, hardly out of Live Oak, you know. <laughs> So uh, I joined up, and then that's whenever uh, they started inducting people. We got into the war before we got back, and we came back. Then uh, we was inducted in the army, and I went to uh, uh, went to the uh, basic training that we had in uh, Camp Landing, Florida. Camp Landing. Camp Landing. Blanding. Oh, okay, yes. Yep. Stark. Okay, Stark. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Now the training over in Louisiana was that at Fort Polk. That was the maneuvers. That was uh, what we were. And was that at Fort know, Polk? Or was that at Fort Polk, Louisiana, Leesville? I don't recall the name of the place we was out in the woods, and I don't recall the name of the place we was at. <laughs> yes, you probably didn't have a whole lot of chance to get into town either. No. Yes. Now, when were you inducted into the Army? Well, we <clears throat> how old was I? You know, when were you inducted actually into the Army? Well, let's see. Let's see. It must have been about a month after this, a uh, month after that, 25th of November, and we came back that uh, that we were inducted in. Oh, right. I don't have the exact date here. Okay. I might have it there on that picture uh, I showed you. Well, when, uh, when did you uh, end up going to Europe? Uh, uh, when I go to Europe? Yes, sir. Can't see too good here. But were you? Did you go right into the hundred and first? No, I was. I was in the infantry out here. Of, uh, of the uh, National Guard, the 124th Infantry. And that was here? Here, uh-huh. And that when did you ship overseas? Well, we, we went overseas. Uh, trying to see. I can't see it too good. Maybe you okay. can see on that. All right, sir. Let's see. And let's see. Date of entry, 20, 25 November 40. That was your entrance into the military. Um, well, I don't, oh, wait a minute. 2nd of February 43, does that sound familiar? That's pretty close to, yeah. Okay, 1943. Um, when you went in, when you were shipped over to Europe, uh, did you, where did you, did you have training before you landed on Normandy? Yeah, we went to England. We were shipped over to England. And, uh, <clears throat> and I received parachute training in England. And uh, <clears throat> parachute and, and jumping. Parachute training and jumping in uh, New Newberry, England. So that's where you did all your actually that's, jumping. Your jump activity that, was in where England. I went to parachute training and jumping from the aircraft. There, we after we went through the, the basic training, you know, before we uh, started jumping. Well, we jumped three times 
the first thing since we landed on the ground with the first one first time well it, uh, they had a truck to pick us up and, and we went right back to the airport and jumped again we did that three times <laughs> and the next day we did <clears throat> jump two times and uh, then we was qualified parachutists. How many but jumps did you make total? I said seven jumps total. Seven? I made two combat jumps. Where did you jump into in the combat? Normandy. <clears throat> I'm having trouble reading. Though. That's, that's I, not I, the problem. That's not that's being too good. So June 6, 44, you landed behind the lines. Yes. Yes. How far, estimate how far behind the German lines were you? Well, I would say it was probably about five or ten miles, yeah. five or ten miles. <clears throat> and we was right off of uh, Omaha Beach there. That was our objective there, was to clear the beaches for the, for the uh, troops to come in uh, off of the boats there. That was uh, the outfit that I was in. That was our objective, was to clear those beaches. Okay, so you were in an engineering company? No, I was the infantry. You were infantry, yep. but you had to... Yeah, but we had to... Clear the beaches? We had to clear the Germans so that they could come in. Oh! That. And, al <laughs> and also, uh, uh, we had artillery people with us that uh, <clears throat> that they, uh, they dismantled the artillery pieces that was firing out on the troops trying to come in. What we were, what were your feelings, your experiences, uh, when you hit the ground? Well, actually, when I when I landed, I, I got separated from my original people that I was with, and I was in the 500, 502nd Parachute Regiment, and uh, I landed in the 506. They was jumping in there too, so. Uh, we had these little clip, click, uh, clickers, you know, like come out of popcorn. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you're familiar with that? Yes, sir. Well, anyway, uh, if you was friendly, I'd, I'd click it one time. And if you was uh, uh, close to me and you were friendly, you'd click back two times. So that's, uh, that's how I got uh, connected with the 506 Parachute Regiment. And uh, <clears throat> I stayed with them all night. Uh, we was worked our way towards the beaches all night long. And uh, there was a lot of firing and shooting going on. And, but we tried to avoid that because we tried as much as we could to get to the beaches because that was our objective. And uh, the next morning, just about daylight, I ran into uh, Major Stopka. He was... Uh, in our outfit, he was uh, in, he was in the same company that I was in, but he was uh, he was one of the officers there, and uh, <clears throat> then we kept gathering people till we got enough people together, and of course that didn't take too long because people started, you know, coming in because we got scattered pretty bad in there. And when we all got together, uh, we we started taking the beaches, and uh, of course there was a lot of Germans in there, and, and we had to eliminate a lot of Germans. A lot of them was captured, and uh, and we got to the beaches, and we we kept the Germans back, so that the infantry, uh, so that the people, some of them was infantry and uh, different kinds of. Uh, of people, you know, that came in by boat. And that was our objective, to get them in so that, uh, say, the infantry outfits, they were divisions of them, you know, and, and artillery and, and tanks and uh, trucks and all that kind of stuff, they came in by boat. And uh, as much as they could get in there. <laughs> so you were basically taking the beachhead yeah, about, in reverse. Yeah, we was taking the beachhead so that the troops could come in without uh, getting killed. Uh, Some of them did kill, did yes. get killed. But, uh, now I understand the Germans didn't know what that clicker was. No. <laughs> yeah. And we was 
and they didn't know we was coming either. We was in the marshland area before we jumped over there in England. And uh, in this marshland area, we were surrounded uh, in a barbed wire, in, uh, in, in uh, a, like uh, encampment there. But it, it was surrounded by barbed wire so that we couldn't get out. And they had guards all around it. And that was for the secrecy of the thing. Uh -huh. And they kept that thing secret. The Germans didn't know we was coming. Well, for goodness sakes. Right. Now, from Normandy, where did you then go to? From Normandy, once y'all had taken the beachhead and, yeah. and secured it, right. where did you go from there? Well, well we, uh, we got our, uh, uh, most of our troops together. And then our, our uh, Colonel Cole was our, our leader there. He was over the 502nd Parachute Regiment. And we all got together and we started moving across the country. The next next objective was Carrington, France. And and uh we took that. And uh we and we kept uh uh we kept operating with all the other people that was connected to us, you know, artillery people. And then they got they got tanks in there and they and they was giving us support too. Now I was in the uh, 81 millimeter mortar, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, we had uh, the rifle companies had 60 millimeters, but then I was a headquarters company, and uh, we had the 81 mortars, and we had the heavy machine guns. Mm -hmm. But the rifle company companies themselves had uh, the smaller. They had rifles and a 60 millimeter border. And uh, and I guess we just kept pressing until we we got taken out of uh, France and taken and took us back to England. And it took us back to England to prepare for another uh, invasion or jump, you know. And, yeah. Uh, the, um 60 millimeter mortar and the 81, quite a little bit of weight difference there. Yeah. Yeah, 81, pretty heavy. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, and it had a big base plate. Yes, sir. And it was mortar about as high as that stand right there. Absolutely, big old barrel. shell about that big. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I saw a Japanese 400 millimeter mortar on Pelu Island in the, in the Palau's, mm -hmm. 400 millimeter that was a big i bet that was like an artillery shell yes it? sir yes sir it was still buried in the cave just the the front of it was sticking out of the dirt mm -hmm. uh, and it was still buried down in that cave and then probably the japanese fellow was in there with it most likely yeah, yeah. <laughs> but where did you go you, you went back to england where did you come back to on the next jump well and we the next one was in september the 17th September 1944 we made a daylight jump in uh, a town called Don uh, a Dutch town called Son and Vagel Holland and that was a daylight jump your last jump that, no that was the last com combat jump from okay. then on, we operated like uh, other infantry outfits. Well, I see here that you have a Purple Heart. Yeah. Where were you wounded? In Bastogne, Belgium. In, oh, you were at Bastogne? Yeah. Oh, for goodness sakes. That's why I got hit and an uh, artillery shell exploded over my head and I got hit in the face. It was there for a long time. I had a big scar across my face. And I was lucky, it, I was real fortunate. Yes. Uh, that absolutely. didn't get my head. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, I understand the stone was a pretty bad, pretty fierce battle. It, it was pretty rough, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, you, they're referred to as the battling bastards of the stone because <laughs> they were fighting like crazy. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
Were you at the Battle of the Bulge as well? That was the Battle of the Bulge. That was the Battle of the Bulge yeah. in part of a stone area. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, I didn't know for a long time what it meant, the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. It was a bulge in the line. Well, yeah, that was the, it was, the Germans was trying to, they had a, they called it the bulge, the Germans were trying to break through. And uh, uh, actually, we had, we, uh, <clears throat> we was in a, uh, an area there, a housing area that in, in uh, France with the, uh, when Bastogne got started, and uh, the uh, uh, infantry outfits got ran over there. The Germans ran over them, mm. and uh, and uh, that's what they call the bugs there. So they, it was an emergency thing to get us in there. So uh, we couldn't jump in there, but they loaded us up on cattle trucks and took us in there all night long. We rode all night long on those things, and there was so many of them in the truck you couldn't sit, sit down. <laughs> oh, for goodness sakes. But anyway, uh, when we got there, the, those guys that was, was trying to get away from the Germans there when we went in, that they had already, they'd already just about uh, took the outfit, but what was remaining left, uh, they, they was trying to get out of there when we we got in there, and we we met them head on. No, so it was a big big fight there, and uh, then uh, General Patton actually saved our life in there. When, uh, when he he was kind of late getting to us, but uh, they'd been trying to get him in there, but he was already in another area that he couldn't turn loose. And uh, I can't remember all of those areas right now. It's been so long. Yes, sir. But uh, but he he gave us backing in there, and so the Germans tried to get us to surrender. And that's where you probably heard of this. This uh, general was talking to the the uh, German generals, and they, and he couldn't understand what he was saying. So he the, the American general just said nuts, you know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Famous statement. Yeah, yeah. Nuts. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, and that and the reason they said that is because he, he didn't know what the Germans were saying. <laughs> but, <laughs> what was your impression of General Patton? Well, I thought he was, I really thought he was a, a good general. He was good. He was a good tank man. We could and use they, another one like him. Yeah, absolutely, we could. You know, the Germans had uh, well-built tanks, heavy armored, and uh, and uh, our tanks uh, didn't have as, uh, as large a gun as the, uh, I, I might say cannons, as the Germans had. And they were so well armored, it was hard for our tanks to knock them out. But they, Patton had devised ways of, of knocking them out. One of the ways was to get in a position where they could knock the tracks off of the tanks and then they could destroy the tank once they did that. Yeah, you know, the German 88 Panzer was yeah. quite a tank. It was, I'm telling you. Yes, sir. You yeah. could hear that thing, you could hear them shooting and and, and, a, and just a second it'd be right over, right over there where you was at. <laughs> no, the Shermans weren't they made was, the... They, they was good, but they... They wasn't powerful as the Germans was. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I've said for years, and I'm sure everybody else, if, if Hitler had listened to some of his generals, we would probably be speaking German now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, but, yeah. Uh, but he was one of these guys, you know, uh, kind of like the president we just got rid of, you know, he wanted to run everything himself. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, but... Um, it, it, it's amazing, really, when I talk to a gentleman like yourself, that what you went through, uh, I, I can't imagine it. I've never been in combat, and you can read all the books in the world about it, but never know until you've been there. Uh, I know you remember stories and things that 
that happened to you? Yeah, you know, it's been so long. So <clears throat> I can I can faintly remember some of them, but it's it's uh, and two, my memory is not as good as it it has been. You know. Well, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, a lot of these things I forget and I can't recall them, you know. Well, did what, your unit ever have reunions? They have reunions, but uh, I don't never go to them. Oh. They don't never have, have them around here, so it's all up north somewhere. Well, I could go to them if I wanted to, you know, pay my way and get up there. And that's a shame. You shouldn't have to pay your way. The American veterans shouldn't have to pay their way like that. You know. Well, they, they have like 101st, they have their own, you know, and so everybody has to, I don't, they don't have enough funds to pay for everybody. Well, I think the federal government ought to be paying their way. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> um, they about to give a little break, about to go broke now. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the, um, you know, every year they have the Iwo Jima reunion. Mm -hmm. And the veterans of Iwo Jima, uh, a lot of them get, get to go over for free, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a long way. Uh, I've been to five, I've been to Iwo Jima five times with the men that fought there. Uh, a, a different war, different war for sure. Yeah. But uh, how did you feel about the average German that you were meeting? Um, how did I feel about the Germans? Yes, sir. Well, the German soldiers, uh, I never had uh, uh, any connection with them, you see. I did go back to Germany after uh, I joined the Air Force. I went back over there for a tour, and the German people was a whole lot different than the German soldier was. And, uh, of course, they had they had people over there that still believed in Hitler, you know. Oh, yes. Yes. But, uh, but on the average, they were, I would consider them nice people. Now, when did you join the Air Force? It was, it was in 1945, but I don't recall the date here right now, but it's, it's probably on that paper uh, I they, showed you. Um, when you, after the war, when you came back home, I stayed out, stayed out about three months and then I uh, re-enlisted in uh, the Air Force. What was it like coming back to Live Oak after being... Well, it, it took me a while to, to adjust, you know. It was, um, I think, I think everybody was, had been in close combat. You, you, uh, your nerves was kind of rattled and it took a a little while to get over that. Well, of course, uh, back then, the PTSD wasn't yeah, a thing they'd ever it, heard of. Didn't know nothing about that. No, sir. You were shell-shocked or whatever, you know, they didn't know what to do. Uh, and that, and so you were back home about three months before you joined yeah, the Air Force. Right. And uh, how long did you stay in the Air Force? Well, I stayed in, uh, well, <clears throat> I stayed in Till I had 20 years in. 20 years, okay. I had a little over 20 years, a few days over. And counting your army time, they, they counted. Yeah. And, uh, um, well, when you got back, uh, during your Air Force time, where were you stationed during the Air Force years? Well, I was in MacDill Air Force Base the first time. <clears throat> and, uh, 307 bomb wing. I don't know if you ever heard of them. 307? Uh-huh. Up to B-29 outfit. Okay. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> then I stayed in there till I uh, got shipped to Aldis, Oklahoma in the 11th bomb wing, which was a B-52 outfit. Mm. And uh, I was in the KC-97, that's refueling tankers. And uh, I was in, actually in them until uh, uh, they, they had an inspection team there. They had a, a squadron of people there that all they did was inspect aircraft. And uh, I got drafted into that. And uh, I was in the, in, the, in the business of inspecting 
uh, KC 197s and B-52s with with a team of men when uh, when I retired. <clears throat> and it's amazing the B-52 is still a good aircraft. Yeah, still a good Over aircraft. 50 years old, it's yeah. still a good aircraft. It is. Yes, sir. Were you still in when they were bringing the KC-135s in for fueling? Yeah. Well, that was a nice aircraft too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I got to make a mission with them out of Eglin Air Force Base, uh, disregard, uh, Anderson Air Force Base mm -hmm. from Guam. I, I made a, one refueling mission with them. It was a nice aircraft. <clears throat> but, uh, was you attached to the KC-97? No, sir. No, sir. I was strictly radar operations for that eight years, mm -hmm. but I did get to go out on a couple missions. Uh, uh, you see them refueling? I went on a refueling mission. They were refueling F-18s. Oh, really? And I laid right back by the boom operator. You look right into the cockpit. Of the, the, <laughs> see the pilot sitting right there, you know. Yeah. I know you know what I mean. You've yeah. seen it probably many, many times. Yes, sir. And then yeah. when, did, when did you retire from the Air Force? It was in 1952. 52? I, I think you look on there, that's got it on there. Um, I thought, did I say 52? <laughs> it didn't, uh, no, it would be later. You were in 20 years? Yeah. And you went in in, in probably about 47, 46? Uh, went in the Air Force? Yes, sir. What was the... Uh, it was in 45. Late 45? Mm -hmm, late 45. Okay, so 55, 65. It would have been in the 60s when you retired then, mm -hmm. sometime in the 60s. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and you came back to Live Oak then? Yes, sir. I got out and came back to Live Oak. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> then I uh, started working for the post office. Well, that was my next question. What did you do after the, you I got worked, back here? I worked for them 15 years. I was, uh, started off with I started off in there as a as a helper, cleaning up the place, janitor, you might say. And then uh, I started carrying the mail in the city. And then I was a rural mail carrier. Mm -hmm. And then after. I, while I was still working for the post office, I started raising cows out here. I built this house out here and then uh, started raising cattle. And I had three chicken houses back out there. So I was raising chickens and cows at the same time and working for the post office at the same time. A busy man. A busy man. Yes, huh? yes sir. <laughs> I will be. But I had, a lot of, I had a lot going for me in them days. I could do it back then. Well, uh, and, and and I rarely ever felt tired. I tell you, and I could sit down for a few minutes and I'm ready to go again. <laughs> well, Mr. Mills, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your service more than anything. Um, it, it's as I say, it's just it's amazing when I talk to somebody like that. How in the world y'all did it? You know. Well. I don't know. I wasn't any braver than anybody else. Well, but you I, I tried that. to try to do my job. Yes, sir. And uh, there's a picture of me. I was uh, in England. That's where oh, I went to the parachute school there. Training jump, Newberry, yeah. England. How about that? Now, how old were you there? <laughs> About how old were you? Uh, I don't really know. <clears throat> you like so many must, of them, you're probably about I 18. And about 35. Oh. 30, no, not that old. Oh, you were probably about 18, 19 years old then, weren't you? Well, I was uh, 19 years old when, we went in the, when I went in the National Guard. Okay. So I had to be about 25. Oh, okay. Okay. There's some of the fast tone pictures there. Was Resupply. I know it, 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 this looks like Korea. 
the Pardon? snow. I said, yep. looks like Korea. You were not ever in Korea. You didn't get involved in that. No. You're good. That's fortunate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, sir. But I know the Battle of the Bulge up there, cold, cold. If I'd have stayed in the, if I'd have stayed in the air, the uh, airborne, I'd have probably wound up in there. Did you ever have any problem with your feet from the cold or? Uh, not really. I, my feet got cold, of course, but uh, I never had uh, frostbite. So you're fortunate. Yeah, I was. Uh, when we uh, left to go in there, uh, they said, take all the warm clothes you can take on you, on your body, and take plenty of socks. And I took plenty of socks with me in my musette bag and uh, other equipment that I had. <clears throat> And uh, whenever uh, in the foxhole, when I had a chance to, I'd sit down and take them, one of the warm socks off of my body and put them on my feet and then take them and put them back on my body. Under your arms. I, I, yeah, I think that's what helped me to keep from getting frostbit. Now, were you wearing leather boots or? Did yeah, we had jump boots on. Okay. Okay, that probably saved your feet. That, that had a lot to do with it, yeah. Yes, sir. You know, the that boots they were in, uh, that they yeah. were putting out during Korea, that rubber boot, caused a lot of men to lose their feet over that. Yeah, it was sweat. That sweat, and uh, yeah, and they carried the socks just like you under their arm, mm -hmm. but it, they'd be soaking wet when they took them off. You know, but. Well, Mr. Mills, I want to thank you, sir. I thank you for your service, and I thank you for time talking with us.